Tonight we are here to discuss the glorious story of Our Lady of Walsingham and the despicable acts of the dissolution of the English monasteries. Walsingham in Norfolk, England is a small village with a large place in the history of Catholicism in the British Isles. In a very real way, it is possible to view the entire history of Catholic Britain by looking at the story of Walsingham, which is my goal. To all outward appearances, Walsingham looks like a moderately prosperous village that could be the set for a movie placed in medieval England. The streets are narrow and quiet. The buildings are brick or half-timbered. It is the sort of place that draws tourists. But those tourists are not drawn there primarily for a taste of merry old England. They have come because Walsingham has the reputation of being England's Nazareth. Walsingham's story begins in the year 1061 with a young Anglo-Saxon noblewoman, Richeldus de Faverches. After the death of her husband, she had the twin burdens of managing the estate and raising her young son, Geoffrey. The king, as it turned out, as it turned out was St. Edward the Confessor, who was in the last years of his reign. Richeldus was especially devoted to Our Lady, and she begged the favor of being able to do some special work for Mary's glory. One night, as Richeldus slept, Our Lady transported her to the home in which the Annunciation had taken place. The idea of pilgrims visiting her home appears to have been very dear to Our Blessed Mother, in much the same way that having children visit is important to most mothers. About 130 years later, the very house that Our Lady showed Richeldus was miraculously transported to Tersanto in Illyria, which is in modern Greece, in 1291, and then to Loreto three years later. It can be visited in Loreto today. Richeldus was then instructed to build a replica of the Holy House in England. Its dimensions were to be 23 feet 6 inches by 12 feet 10 inches. Along with these instructions, came Our Lady's promise that, quote, whoever seeks my help there will not go away empty-handed. Richeldus then prayed about the exact spot on her estate where the house should be constructed. One particular night, there was an extremely heavy dewfall. However, two sites on the estate of roughly equal size, both appropriate to the construction of the holy house, were left dry. Since one was nearer a well, Richeldus decided that the pilgrims to come would be better served by building the holy house on that site. She hired carpenters to build the house according to the instructions that she had been given by Our Lady. However, these skilled carpenters, who had built many other structures, did not seem to get the building constructed. Measurements would be carefully taken, joints and mortises cut, but when the time came to assemble them, they simply would not fit. Repeated efforts were met with an equal lack of success. Miraculously, on the same night that the carpenters gave up their efforts, Our Lady showed the wealth of her power by having angels construct and complete the house in one night on the other side. This sign of Our Lady's favor rapidly became known in the area and throughout the British Isles. Pilgrims began to come in great numbers almost immediately. After his mother's death, Geoffrey de Faverges constructed a Gothic chapel around the Holy House to protect it from the elements. He also constructed a priory and a church, and gave the site to the Augustinian order. Over the next 500 years, Walsingham became an increasingly popular site for pilgrimages. A custom had developed that pilgrims would arrive at the village, go to a small chapel called the Slipper Chapel, remove their footwear, and go the last mile barefoot. When they arrived, they would see this impressive structure. Its form is common to that of many of England's monasteries. The monks lived and worked in buildings surrounding an open area. Daily processions would take place through the cloister and into the church, where worship would be conducted according to the liturgy of the hours. 
also to be found in many such establishments were simple rooms in which pilgrims could find accommodations, as well as schools, libraries, and hospitals. The farms around the monastery provided the means for meeting the physical needs of the monastic community. A village like Walsingham was very fortunate to have a pilgrimage site nearby, because such meeting the needs of pilgrims to these sites became the primary economic support for the village. One such pilgrim was Desiderius Erasmus, who visited in 1511. Erasmus left a written record of his visit with the description, Within that building, which, as I have said, was unfurnished, there is a small chapel with worn wooden planking, which admits by a narrow door on either side those who come to visit Our Lady. The light is feeble, in fact, scarcely any, excepting from wax candles. A most delightful fragrance gladdens one's nose. When you look in, you would say it is the abode of saints, so brilliantly does it shine on all sides with gems, gold, and silver. Although many of Erasmus's writings were of a cynical and sarcastic nature, scholars, including the 19th century scholar and author of Pietas Mariana Britannica, Edmund Waterton, whose devotion to Our Lady can be seen in the most casual reading of that book, regards this description as factual. Although the vast majority of pilgrims were simple folk from the surrounding areas, the wealthy and illustrious were visitors to Our Lady of Walsingham as well. Included among the many pilgrims were seven different kings of England. Henry III was the first king to visit Walsingham. This Henry was especially devoted to the memory of the man who had been king when the shrine was first constructed, St. Edward the Confessor. His son, King Edward I, the current numbering of English kings begins with William the Conqueror in 1066, gave Our Lady of Walsingham credit for saving his life when a floor underneath him collapsed and he fell some twenty feet. He visited eleven times during his reign. Of course, among the kings who made present uh, pilgrimages to the shrine was the man who would be responsible for its destruction, Henry VIII. Henry VIII inherited a nation that had come to be called Mary's Dowry, for the large level of faithfulness to the Church and devotion to Our Lady. The kingdom contained over 800 monasteries, nunneries, and friaries, containing over 10,000 members. Over the years as well, wise land use and numerous gifts and bequests meant that over 30% of the land in Great Britain, exclusive of Scotland, which was not yet under English rule, was owned by the Church. In fact, a modern scholar speculates that it was all but impossible to walk for more than one half hour in any direction in medieval England without coming across a monastic establishment, although he did say you had to walk an hour if you were in Wales. Unfortunately, all of that wealth proved to be an irresistible temptation to the most famously corrupt king in English history, for it was under Henry's reign that every one of those establishments would be dissolved, and many, including Walsingham, destroyed. Perhaps the un most unfortunate aspect of Henry's disastrous reign was that it began so hopefully. The young Henry appeared to be everything that could be hoped for in a monarch. He was young, handsome, learned, athletic, musical, and rich as can be seen in this description provided by the ambassador of Venice to Henry's court. His majesty is the most handsome potentate I ever set eyes on. He was born on the 28th of June, 1491, so he will enter his 25th year the month after next. He speaks French, English, and Latin, and a little Italian, plays well on the lute and harpsichord, sings from a book at sight, draws the bow with greater strength than any man in England, and jousts marvelously. Modern people might refer to Henry as a triple threat guy, smart, handsome, and athletic. 
Through his very fortunate marriage to a, the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, England enjoyed a very good relationship with Spain, which was the wealthiest and most powerful kingdom in Europe at the time, partially due to the wealth that its explorers had brought back from the New World. Among young Henry's virtues was piety. In addition to the pilgrimage to Walsingham mentioned earlier, he paid for new glazing for the windows for the building that surrounded the Holy House during the years 1511 and 1512. He paid the salary of a priest at Walsingham whose sole responsibility was to say masses for the king. He also made an annual payment so that there would always be a candle before the statue of Our Lady of Walsingham burning in his behalf. He once was a spirited defender of Holy Mother Church. When Luther's rebellion broke out in 1517, Henry looked on in alarm. When Luther officially separated from the church in 1521, Henry wrote a, wrote a book called Defense of the Seven Sacraments, in which he soundly refuted Luther's heresies. The book won for Henry the title of Defender of the Faith, bestowed upon him by His Holiness, Pope Leo X, a title that is, rather ironically, still used by the British royal family. Incidentally, after Henry VIII broke with the Catholic Church, Pope Paul III excommunicated Henry and rescinded the grant of the title Defender of the Faith in 1538, but the English Parliament declared that the title remained valid. On May 21, 1521, Henry wrote to Pope Leo, please forgive me for quoting at such length, No duty is more incumbent on a Catholic sovereign than to preserve and increase the Christian faith and religion, and the proofs thereof, and to transmit them thus preserved, inviolate to posterity, by his example in preventing them from being destroyed by any assailant of the faith, or in any wise impaired. So when we learned that the pest of Martin Luther's heresy had appeared in Germany, and was raging everywhere with outlet or hindrance, to such an extent that many, infected with its poison, were falling away, especially those whose furious hatred, rather than their zeal for Christian truth, had prepared them to believe all of its subtleties and lies. We were so deeply grieved at this heinous crime of the German nation, for whom we have no light regard, and for the sake of the holy apostolic see, that we bent our thoughts and energies on uprooting in every possible way this cockle, this heresy from the Lord's flock. When we perceived that this deadly venom had advanced so far, and had seized upon the weak and ill-disposed minds of so many, that it could not be easily overcome by a single effort, we deemed that nothing could be more efficient in destroying the contagion than to declare these errors worthy of condemnation, after that they had been examined by a convocation of learned and scholarly men from all parts of our realm. This course of action we likewise recommend to a number of others. In the first place, we earnestly entreated His Imperial Majesty, through our fraternal love for Him, and all the electoral princes, to bethink them of our Christian duty and their lofty station, and to destroy this pernicious man, together with his scandalous and heretical publications after his refusal to return to God. But convinced that, in our ardor for the welfare of Christendom, in our zeal for the Catholic faith, and our devotion to the apostolic see, we had not yet done enough. We determined to show by our own writings our apt attitude toward Luther and our opinion of his vile books, to manifest more openly to all the world that we shall ever defend and uphold the Holy Roman Church, not only by force of arms, but by resources of our intelligence and our services as a Christian. However, 
it was not to last. Greed, jealousy, pride, self-indulgence, and lust bred a revolutionary spirit in Henry that would bring disaster on his immediate family, his Tudor dynasty, his kingdom, and the church in England. About 1525, it became obvious that Queen Catherine would never be able to bear the male heir that Henry desired. At this point, Henry faced an admittedly difficult situation. His father, Henry VII, had become king at the conclusion of the Wars of the Roses that had torn England apart for over thirty years. Having neither sons nor brothers, Henry could have added to the glory of his reign by accepting God's will and spending the remaining twenty-two years of his life guaranteeing an orderly succession to his daughter or to any one of a number of those who had legitimate claims on the English throne. Instead, he embarked on the disastrous round of affairs, marriages, divorces, and debauchery that would consume him and his nation's wealth. This pattern is not unfamiliar to students of Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira to quote a paragraph from his many writings. But if a person makes any concession to the vices of pride and impurity, there begins to arise in him an incompatibility with various aspects of the church and the order of the universe. That incompatibility can begin, for example, with an antipathy toward the hierarchical character of the church, then spread and extend to the hierarchy of temporal society to eventually manifest itself even regarding the hierarchical order of the family. Henry's concessions were many, and the effects were severe. Henry's henchman in the dirty work of dissolving the monasteries was Thomas Cromwell. Early in his career, Cromwell had been a protege of Henry's close friend and advisor, Cardinal Wolsey. When Wolsey was unable to obtain Henry's divorce from the Pope, Cromwell distanced himself from his one-time mentor and was instrumental in spreading the rumors of disloyalty to Henry that caused Wolsey to be executed. Cromwell's career was furthered by his friendship with and support of Anne Boleyn, who he later turned on as well. Unlike Henry, whose exact religious views grew more and more confused as time went by, Cromwell made no secret of his Protestant evangelical leanings. His method for the disillusion was to buy off the abbot, prior, or mother superior by promises of a royal pension for the leader and sometimes key members of the community. Of course, such a sale of the church's property was canonically illegal, and Henry's and Cromwell's works did not go unresisted. In the north of England, loyal Catholics marching under a banner depicting the five wounds of our Lord tried to resist the disillusion. In September of 1536 they rose, but were quickly and ruthlessly suppressed. Soon thereafter a similar movement arose in Yorkshire, comprising 40,000 men under the leadership of the lawyer Robert Ask. The Duke of Norfolk, with Henry's blessing, marched against the movement, now dubbed the Pilgrimage of Grace. The pilgrimage met with considerable success, and the pilgrims only dispersed when Norfolk promised to present their concerns in a document called the Twenty-Four Articles to King Henry. He also promised a general pardon to the rebels, and a parliament at which they could present their grievances to take place at the city of York. As a false sign of interest in a settlement, Ask was invited to meet with the king himself, but got nothing but a series of vague and worthless promises that Henry had no intention of keeping. In January, a similar rebellion, led by Sir Francis Bigod, a one-time associate of Cardinal Wolsey's and a distant relative of the Duke of Norfolk, rose to resist the king. Bagod's association with the Pilgrimage of Grace was sketchy, 
if indeed there was any connection at all. Exactly what his motives were is difficult to state exactly. He was a Protestant, but not a supporter of Henry's scheme to institute a new church with himself at its head. The new uprising gave Henry the excuse he wanted to move against the pilgrimage of grace and Bigod's uprising, and both were brutally put down. When Cromwell came to Walsingham, the prior, Richard Vowell, either hoping that the shrine would be spared, or because he had come to the conclusion that resistance was futile, was open to Cromwell's offer of pensions. The sub-prior, Nicholas Milam, and other members of the community were not so complacent. They argued in favor of resistance. Milam was charged with starting a rebellious conspiracy and convicted of high treason. He and ten others were hanged, drawn, and quartered outside of the priory's walls. In July 1538, Prior Vowell assented to the destruction of Walsingham Priory. He actually assisted in the removal of the Priory's collection of valuables, as well as the famous figure of Our Lady. For his ready compliance, the Prior received a pension of 100 pounds a year, which would be about $73,000 today. The site was sold by order of Henry VIII to Thomas Sidney for 90 pounds, and a private mansion was subsequently erected on the grounds of the Priory. In the most revolting act of despoilation, the statue of Our Lady from the shrine was taken to London and burned, with Cromwell looking on to make sure that the destruction was complete. We know little about the actual destruction of the Priory at Walsingham, but the destruction of the monasteries followed a similar pattern, unless they were to be used as Anglican parish churches or as aristocratic homes for Henry's favorites. First, they were stripped of all precious metals, including Eucharistic vessels and any jewels that might be there. Then the roofs were stripped so that the lead could be used for other buildings. Often the larger beams would be removed so that they too could be used in other construction. Wood of any size was becoming rare in a country in which it was being used for most buildings, many tools, and all heating and cooking. The stones were also carted away by any and all to be used for other purposes. As mentioned earlier, the site of the shrine and grounds of the priory was granted by the crown to Thomas Sidney in return for a payment of 90 pounds. The destruction of the monasteries marked the first time that so much land had been available for purchase, and many newly rich families used the opportunity to pass from being middle-class merchants to becoming landed gentry. Subsequent generations often were able to climb into the titled aristocracy. Interestingly, many of the men who voted to commit regicide against Charles I in 1649 were members of such families. The dissolution had other harmful effects on British society. With the destruction of the monasteries, the only facilities that met the needs of the poor and sick were destroyed as well. Within a very few years, the government saw the need to use state resources to set up poor houses and hospitals, and this was the be beginning of the assumption of those responsibilities by the state. Along with the destruction of the monasteries was the destruction of their libraries, containing many irreplaceable records of the Anglo-Saxon and Northern Norman kingdoms, and no one knows what else. To return to the story of Walsingham specifically, the entire priory, including the Holy House, was demolished as Cromwell's associates attempted to drive from public memory the fact that the site, sometimes called England's Nazareth, had ever existed. Only fragments, as seen in this view from 1858, remained. The history of the English Catholic monarchs, martyrs during the reign of Henry VIII, Edward VI, Henry's son, and Elizabeth I is far too complex to go into in any detail here, but it is truly harrowing.
After 1585, any priest found on English soil who had been ordained since 1559 was automatically deemed a traitor. Any layman harboring such a priest was a felon. Both could be punished by death. Therefore, it is no wonder that the identity of the author of the Walsingham Lament is unknown. Weep, weep, O Walsingham, whose days are turned to nights. Blessings turn to blasphemies, holy deeds to despites. Sin is where Our Lady sat, heaven is turned to hell. Satan sitteth where Our Lord dis did sway. Walsingham, O oh, farewell. Even though the exact identity of the author of the lament is unknown, there is a legend that its author was St. Philip Howard, another interesting character in the amazing story of Walsingham. The Howard family had been among the first to embrace Henry VIII's revolution, and from the time Philip was seven, he was raised in a building that had been a Carthusian monastery. To all appearances, Philip was merely a courtier and bon vivant, about twenty-five years younger than his cousin, Queen Elizabeth I. His sense of humor made him a favorite of the aging queen. It appears that Elizabeth and he visited the site of the now-destroyed shrine at Walsingham. While any effect on Elizabeth is unrecorded, the effect had a profound effect on Philip. It seems that for some time Philip had been considering conversion to the true church. Knowing life at Elizabeth's court as he did, he was fully aware of the dangers presented by such a conversion. For under Elizabeth, Henry's persecutions intensified. Nonetheless, his conscience refused to be quieted, and he did embrace Catholicism. Since this amounted to a capital crime, Elizabeth confined him to the Tower of London, but was unwilling to have him executed because of her personal regard for him. He remained in the Tower for ten years until his death from dysentery. As he lay dying, he petitioned Elizabeth to allow him to see his wife and son, who had been born after his imprisonment. The Queen responded that, If he will but once attend the Protestant service, he shall not only see his wife and children, but be restored to his honors and estates with every mark of my royal favor. To this Howard replied, Tell her majesty that if my religion be the cause for which I suffer, sorry I am that I have but one life to lose. He remained in the tower, never seeing his wife, son, or daughter again and died alone on Sunday, October the 19th, 1595. Although he was initially buried inside the walls of the tower, his body was later moved to Arundel Castle, his ancestral home. Today, in nearby Arundel Cathedral, there is a shrine to St. Philip Howard. The image atop the shrine also features a dog. The dog performed a significant service for Philip during the decade he was kept in the tower. The prisoners in the tower were not allowed to see each other in person, but the dog carried messages between Philip and the other prisoners, many of whom were also victims of Elizabeth's persecutions, most notably the priest, St. Robert Southwell. Although these two men never met, Howard's dog helped them to deepen their friendship and exchange encouragement in each other's plight. Southwell, not having the advantage of being a friend of Elizabeth, was executed. Both Philip and Robert Southwell were canonized by Pope Paul VI in 1970 as two of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. As mentioned before, Elizabeth I's government passed anti-Catholic decrees in 1571 forbidding anyone from maintaining the jurisdiction of the Pope by word, deed, or act, requiring the use of the Book of Common Prayer in all cathedrals, churches, and chapels, and forbidding criticism of it, 
forbidding the publication of any bull, writing, or instrument of the Holy See, and prohibiting the importation of Agnus Dei images, crosses, pictures, beads, or other things from the Bishop of Rome. Later laws made the following activities illegal. To draw anyone away from the state religion, non-attendance at a Church of England church, raising children with teachers that were not licensed by an Anglican diocesan bishop, and attending or celebrating the Catholic Mass. In 1585, a new decree was issued that made it a crime punishable by death to go overseas to receive the sacrament of ordination to the Catholic priesthood. A seminary for English Catholics who were called to the priesthood was set up in Reims, France, and many priests who were educated there met the traditional and gruesome death of traitors being hanged, disemboweled, and quartered. Although these laws were loosely enforced after about the year 1700, the Catholic Church remained illegal in Great Britain, and Catholics usually kept a very low profile. In 1829, a bill entitled An Act for the Relief of His Majesty's Roman Catholic Subjects was passed by Parliament. The specific impetus behind the passage of the bill was the election of an Irish Catholic, Daniel O'Connell, to the Parliament. When O'Connell was denied his seat, his supporters threatened civil unrest. In light of this threat, Sir Robert Peel, the Home Secretary, which is the British equivalent to the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, put his weight behind the movement for Catholic emancipation. Peel had previously been adamantly against the idea of emancipation and had actually challenged O'Connell to a duel in 1815. His comment when he was asked for the reason for his change of position was, quote, Though emancipation was a great danger, civil strife was a greater danger. To overcome vehement opposition, the Duke of Wellington worked tirelessly to ensure passage in the House of Lords and threatened to resign as Prime Minister if King George IV did not give royal assent. Of course, most of you will recognize the Duke of Wellington as the general who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. O'Connell did eventually get to take his seat in Parliament, although by the time he actually entered Parliament, a descendant of St. Philip Howard had already become the first Catholic to sit in Parliament since Henry's revolution. With Catholic emancipation, faithful Catholics began once again to gather at Walsingham. In 1897, Pope Leo XIII gave his permission for official pilgrimages to the site to resume. The only structure associated with the medieval shrine to survive somewhat intact was the Slipper Chapel, which, as noted previously, pilgrimage, pilgrims would remove their shoes and proce process the last mile to the shrine barefoot. In 1893, a wealthy convert to Catholicism, Miss Charlotte Boyd purchased the chapel, which at the time was being used as a barn, and paid for its restoration, which was actually not done for many years. For whatever reason, the Catholic Bishop of Northampton, in which Diocese Walsingham was lo then located, wanted nothing to do with the chapel, nor did his two immediate successors. Only when Bishop Lawrence Ewens was appointed by Pope Pius XI in 1933 was the actual work of restoration completed. The first Mass to be held there since the dissolution took place on the Feast of the Assumption in 1934. The following Sunday, the Catholic Archbishop of Westminster, Francis Bourne, led a pilgrimage of 12,000 people to Walsingham. During Restoration, a scholar in the British Museum discovered a wax seal which bore an image of the medieval statue destroyed by Henry VIII. A photo of the seal and a more visible drawing based upon it are displayed on this slide. From that image, 
it was possible to reconstruct a copy of the original wooden statue, which is on display in the Slipper Chapel. Here you can see a photograph of the statue, with a brief explanation of the various images displayed within the image itself. I would like to conclude this presentation with a reading of the, a verse of a ballad written about the year 1640 to Our Lady of Walsingham. Copies of the entire ballad are easily available on the internet. The medieval English is a bit of a puzzle for modern eyes, but the obvious piety of the writer still shines through to us almost 600 years later. O oh, gracious lady, glory of Jerusalem, Cyprus of Sion and joy of Israel, Rose of Jericho and star of Bethlehem, O glorious lady, our asking not repel, In mercy all women ever thou dost excel, Therefore, blessed lady, grant thou thy great grace To all that devoutly visit in this place. Our Lady of Walsingham, pray for us.